much, Dong Mercy. Uh, uh, first of all, I would like to say thank you for introducing me. Uh, actually, uh, Mercy was one of God's instrument why um, I was able to study at Mountain View College. No, uh, he, uh, she brought me at uh, in Mountain View College, and praise God that I finished my 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 course. And of, um, also, we'd like to say thank you, everyone, for joining our worship this morning and for giving me or for allowing me to have this time to, to speak with you uh, the words of God. Uh, I'm so happy to be here this morning. And um, uh, please pray that our connection would be good because outside it's raining and here in in, in Davo, uh, Davo del Sur, once it's uh, uh once it is raining, then expect that there will be a an inter interruption of connection, internet connection. So please pray that um, our worship this morning will not be hindered by internet connection. Okay. So again, thank you also for uh, for the song, no, brother Gary. Thank you so much for the talent that you have uh, shared to all of to all of us. And before we start our study this morning. I would like to invite you to a prayer. Shall we pray? Let's pray. Our most gracious, kind, loving Heavenly Father, this beautiful morning, Lord, we are so happy for giving us this time, this wonderful opportunity to study again your words. And thank you so much that you will bless us today, that our worship this morning will reach before your throne of grace so that every one of us will be revived and uh, will be transformed by your power. Thank you so much, Lord, that you will help us to understand your words this morning. And thank you that you will send your Holy Spirit to work in our heart from uh, today until you come. And thank you so much for the complete forgiveness of our sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, our study this morning is entitled At the Temple Gate. and the key text is found in Acts chapter 3, verses 1 to 10. I would like to share to you a uh, my PowerPoint presentation, okay? Makita uh, Raba, no? Can you see the yes. presentation? Yes. Okay, thank you. So is it okay if I will do this? Uh, I will not slideshow this presentation because I have some notes. And um, oh, okay, lang ba, no? Yes. Thank you. So again, our topic this morning is entitled "At the Temple Gate." It is found in Acts chapter three, verses one to ten. I will read to you what the Bible says. According here, in verse one, it says, "One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of the prayer at three in the afternoon. Verse 2, now a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful. He was where he was put every day to beg from uh, those going into the temple courts. In verse 3, it says, when he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Verse 4, Peter looked straight at him as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave, the, gave, uh, gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. In verse uh, 6, then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. 7, taking, uh, taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit, who used to sit begging at a temple gate called Beautiful. And they, and, um, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. This story actually had took place at the place called Beautiful. Let me show you a reconstruction of the Temple of Jerusalem 
in the year 62 to uh, AD 62 to AD 64. Now, this was the reconstruction of the Temple of Jerusalem. So as you see here, uh, this temple actually have um, 30, uh, 10 gates, 10 gates in order for you to enter the sanctuary. So one of the gate was there in the east side, we have the gate beautiful, okay? The gate uh, beautiful. So perhaps uh, the, 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 the story was located in this site here. So passing through the gate, beautiful, you have the women's courtyard. Then you have the gate of Nicanor. Then you have the priest courtyard and you have the Israelites courtyard. And surrounding the temple or sanctuary was the courtyard of the Gentiles. So inside the temple, uh, Allah, there are there are at least uh, three courtyards: the one for the women, one for the Israelites, and one for the priests. So when Peter and John went to the temple, Peter and John would go to the Israelites' courtyard. It's only for men because the courtyard of women is separated from the courtyard of men. So here. The eastern side. So Peter and John was going up, was going to the temple. So this was the place or the location of the story. And the story was after the Pentecost, no? Because a uh, Pentecost was 50 days from Jesus' resurrection. So 50 days, then you have the Pentecost. And according here, according to the spirit of prophecy, that this incident was a few days after the Pentecost uh, event. So, there are five things that I would like to share to you this morning. Now, five points. What are those? Number one, we will look at the man's condition. Number two, the man's purpose. Why at the temple? Why at the temple? Why not at the public market or some other else, some other places? Number three, it's the man's request. Number four, the man's healing and the man's celebration. So, these are the five things or the five key points that I would like to bring to you this morning in our study. Number one, let's start with the man's condition. According to uh, verse two, no? According to verse two, now a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. So here we have a man who was crippled from birth. In other words, this person, he was born into a situation where he was never going to be able to live a normal, normal life. Without God's intervention, this per person could not walk for the rest of his life. This man had never stood up on his own feet, never taken a step or gone for a walk since, since at his birth. He had to, to depend on his friends or family to carry him every day, uh, everywhere, day and night. He had to hope that he didn't, uh, that his fam, his family members, his friends, would not forget forget him to pick him up and leave him outside all night. So this person, his life is full of hope, trusting his friends that his friends would never forget him. He would be able, or he uh, this person was the, was so dependent on his friends that he would not be able to defend himself. He's completely at the mercy of others. Literally, his life consists of hoping, trusting, and praying that God's people would have mercy on him to give him enough money so he so that he can survive and not starve to death. So this was the condition. This was the situation of this person. This person lived a miserable life, a life of begging money from other people. And if you look at verse 3, it talks about the man's purpose. Why at the temple? Why he was there at the temple? Of course, it says here that when Peter, uh, when he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. 
So he was there. The purpose was to us money. In the Bible, it says here that in verse 1, that this time Peter and John went to the temple at the ninth hour or three o'clock in the afternoon. It was also the time of the evening to meet one of the two sacrifices held daily in the temple. In the, Jew, in the Jewish practice, they had these uh, two services, one in the morning and one in the afternoon. That's the morning sacrifice and the evening sacrifice. Morning sacrifice took place uh, around nine o'clock in the morning, in our time, no? In our time, it's nine o'clock, but in their time, they call it three o'clock in the morning, okay? So in the afternoon, it's nine o'clock. In our time, it's three o'clock in the afternoon, okay? So this had become prescribed times of prayer and people would come to the temple at the sacrifice time to pray. So it was their practice that every day, they would go up to the temple once in the morning and once, uh, once in the afternoon to pray. And the largest crowds would, would thus have been found at times of the sacrifice. So the, 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 the place called Beautiful or the gate called Beautiful was, thus, was a strategic place of this person to ask arms, ask money from the people, people because uh, people would go at the temple once in the morning and once in the afternoon. The afternoon tamid was the final stage of the daily temple worship. The crowds would soon have been gone for the day. Now, the evening sacrifice was one of the two major periods of worship, and many would have come to the temple at precisely this time to express their devotion to God. It was a prime time for receiving alms. So here, this person uh, had chosen to be at the temple gate to ask money because it was the right time, the right place for him to ask money from the people because people would go to the temple to, to connect themselves with the God. And so he thought that upon uh, coming out from the temple, of course, this person, since they already uh, uh, expressed their devotion to God, then perhaps these people would have pitied him or would uh, their heart would be softened by their devotion or softened by his situation and people would give alms of money to to this person. In fact, the rabbis thought that there were three pillars for the Jewish faith. Number one, the Torah. Number two, the worship. And number three, it's showing kindness or charity. Okay? So those are the three pillars of Jewish faith, according to the rabbis. Now, almsgiving was one of the main ways to show kindness and was thus considered a major expression of one's devotion to God with their mindset on worship. So people, their mindset on worship, those who entered the temple for the evening sacrifice and prayer would be particularly disposed to practice their piety by generously giving alms to a lame beggar. And so uh, this person had chosen the right place at the right time to ask money from the people. However, you know, according to the spirit of prophecy, there was a primary reason why this person came at the temple gate. Perhaps by reading the, the Bible, we could say, oh, the purpose of the person is only to ask money. But my friends, the reason why this person was there at the temple was more than asking money. According to Ellen White, no? let me read you the statement of Ellen White in the Acts of the Apostles, pages 57 to 58. According here, it says that after, a short after the descent of the Holy Spirit, and immediately after a season of earnest prayer, Peter and John going up to the temple to worship saw at the gate a cripple 40 years of age whose life from his birth had been one of pain and infirmity. So this person was 40 years, of, uh, 40 years old. This unfortunate man had long desired to see Jesus that he might be healed. So he was there at the temple. His primary purpose at the, at the temple, why he was there, was to, uh, 
to see Jesus so that he would receive healing from the Savior. But, but he was almost helpless and was far removed from the scene of the great physician's labor. His pleadings at last induced some friends to bear him to the gate of the temple. But upon arriving there, he found that the one upon whom his hopes were centered had been put a, to a cruel death. He had lost his hope as the smoke fades and vanishes, so as the hope of this man. He came to the temple because he longed, he longed, or he longed, desired to see Jesus. He wanted to be healed. Unfortunately, Jesus had been put to death more or less, I mean, less than 100 days of Jesus, from the death of Jesus. And so in order to survive, this person asked alms, asked money from the people just for the sake of survival because his hope faded and vanished. Now, let's continue reading our Bible. And let's look at the third uh, point, the man's request. According to verses 3 and 4, it says, when, Peter, uh, when he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. In verse 5, so the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. So here, the situation was Peter and John were going on their way or were going their, uh, on their way to the temple to pray. And as the man saw them about to enter the temple, he asked them for money. All he wanted from Peter and John were a few coins. The man could, not, could look no farther than his immediate physical needs. He thought that all he needed was money to solve his immediate problem. Remember, this person was hopeless. He became hopeless because the person whom he wanted to see, whom he desired to see so that he would be healed from his illness, was put to death, and now he lived a life, a hopeless life. My friends, in a Christian life, the greatest danger and challenge that anyone could have is to live life without hope. This person lived a life without hope because his hope had been gone. Because the person whom he centered his hope had died. And so, when he asked money, from Peter and John. And when Peter said, look at us, that's why this person was so excited because Peter and John said, hey, look at us. And so this person was expecting something to receive something or money from them. But when Peter said, silver or gold, I do not have. I could imagine the discouragement desperation of this person because what he needed that that time was money but peter, uh, peter said i don't have money my friend i don't have money it must have been discouraging for this crippled beggar to hear peter's words no saying silver and gold have i none i do not have money to give you my friend but now, one thing in this story, you know, one good thing in the story because we have the word, but Peter said, I don't have money, but it means if the following statement would be contradictory or opposite to what his previous, pre previous sta statement, it says, but what I do have, I give you, I have something that I would like to give you. Yes, I don't have money to give you, but I have something. It's Peter said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk, rise up and walk, according to some versions. 
no? That Peter's words must have been caught, no? The crippled beggar of God. What would Peter give to this man if, if it's not money? Because this person was only expecting money, 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 money. Because of his immediate need. But Peter said to the man in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise and walk. Yes. Peter said, look at us. But I would like to tell you, there was nothing worthy to look at to Peter and John. Remember, this, this humble uh, Galileans, these humble disciples of Jesus, they what neither they, they possessed wealth nor held a prestigious position in society. They had never studied or conferred degrees at the University of Jerusalem. They possessed nothing. However, they had the most or they have the most valuable treasure in the world and that is Jesus Christ. Jesus was internalized in the ministry, in the life and ministry of Peter and John that they were so confident in saying, look in us. My friends, I would like to tell you this, that only when we have Jesus in our lives that we can say to other people, in the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. According to Acts of the Apostles, page 57, it says, the disciples of Christ had a deep sense of their own inefficiency. Peter and John knew that they could not do this. They could not perform this miracle. And with humiliation and prayer, they joined their weakness to his strength, their ignorance to his wisdom, their unworthiness to his righteousness, their poverty to his exhaustless wealth. Thus strengthened and equipped, they hesitated not to press forward in the service of the Messiah. Only when we connect our lives with God, that we can do something, we could become a blessing or bring blessing to other people. Yes, the basic, but the basic question, fundamental question that I would like to ask to you this morning is can other people see Jesus in us? Peter and John, they had a close relationship with God. That's why they were able to bring blessing to this person. Yes, can other people see Jesus in our lives? Can they feel Jesus in our words? Can they see Jesus in our actions? Can our family, members, or friends, workmates, and neighbors say, thank you so much that I have seen Jesus in your life and I am blessed. My friends, my dear uh, colleagues in the service of God, my co-missionaries, if other people cannot see Jesus in our lives, perhaps we too need healing. If other people see cannot uh, cannot if other people cannot see Jesus in our words and our actions, perhaps we have to question. I think I have I need to be healed by Jesus, because here in our story, aside from the people watching, there are two parties here. Peter and John and the beggar. If we are not like the disciples, if other people cannot see Jesus in our lives, then perhaps you are like that person who needs healing. Perhaps we need healing for our own sickness. Sickness of gossiping and lying. Sickness of treachery and dishonesty. Sickness of murmuring and stubbornness of selfishness and arrogance, of unfairness and injustice, jealousy and strife, destructive criticism and resentment, of being indifferent to the needs of others, or perhaps sickness of pride and self-importance. Perhaps many of us think that we are good, that anyway, I am now living a beautiful life with God. Perhaps we're thinking that we don't have problem spiritually. 
But I would like to tell you, perhaps, if people cannot see Jesus in our lives, then we, we have to reevaluate ourselves. And perhaps we need healing from our own sickness. One cannot give what he has not received, nor can he truly give from an ungenerous heart. He cannot give Christ. He cannot give of Christ when he does not possess Christ. When we don't have Jesus in our lives, do not expect that others will be blessed by our presence. Do not expect that we will bring blessing to other people if we ourselves, we do not, we do not have Christ. If the Spirit of God cannot reign in our heart, or if the Spirit of God cannot reign and sit on the throne of our heart, then someone has already taken the place. If God is not the, is not the king in our heart, then I think the other party is reigning in our heart. However, there was a wonderful message found in verses 7 and 8. Now, the man's healing. It says that he, here in verse 7, taking him by the right hand, he helped him up and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. Wow, what a wonderful scenario. That this person who was crippled for 40 years, jumping and walking and leaping, it was his first time to use his feet to stand alone without the help of others. What a wonderful blessing for this person. However, healing did not happen right then. For Peter had to reach out his hand to lift the lame man, according to verse 7, taking him by the right hand. Because in verse 6, it says that when, when Peter said, silver and gold, I have none, I have no money, but I have something to give you in the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. And so in verse 7, Peter had to reach out his hand till the poor man's feet and ankle bones received strength. Peter told him to stand up and walk. Peter did not stop there, but Peter reached out and helped the man up. Sometimes the community does not need only our message, but our actions as well. Yes, it's good to share the good news of, of, of the good news about uh, how good God in our lives, but sometimes what people need is our action. Not only in words, but action. Yes, God has given us opportunities to help other people, especially those people who are dying because of poverty, because of, of misfortune. And God has given us these resources to help these people so that they would see how great is our God through our actions. Peter took the man by the hand and lifted him up. The man was immediately made whole. His bones received strength. The lame man had never stood on his feet before this miracle. Now he was leaping and walking and jumping and praising God. The lame man went into the, in, uh, went in the temple with Peter and John. He was praising God. He had asked for arms and God had given him healthy legs. Thanksgiving and praise flowed from the lips of this crippled man. There was no silencing him for he was full of joy of the Lord. Yes, people would serve our God if they see Jesus in our words and above all in our actions. In verses 8 to 10. Man's celebration. It says here that he jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. 
Worship was a natural response from a man who had been touched by God. This man, because he received healing, his life was transformed from being a crippled, crippled to a man who could use his, oh, his own feet without the help of others. There was his no word can express how grateful he was. So that's why he was jumping and leaping just like he was like a young boy who received a wonderful gift from his this man or the man's life was changed people who knew him as a lame beggar were now seeing him walking and praising God God used this miracle to be a means of getting the greater message of salvation to, pe to the people. Peter began to preach to the people the resurrection of Christ and the people's need to repent and receive Jesus as their Savior. What a wonderful opportunity for Peter and John to preach the gospel to other people without hindrance because they had performed a wonderful, wonderful blessing to this person. Yes, the transformation of character is a natural resort, result of a person who experiences the power and the presence of God. Because when Jesus comes in, he always brings changes to one's life. But if our lives haven't changed, if our lives have not changed, then perhaps we haven't or we have not experienced the power and the presence of Jesus. If we haven't, or if our lives are still the same, when we are not yet in Jesus, if there's no change in our lives, my friends, I think we need healing and we need to experience again the power of Jesus. Because when Jesus comes in, he always brings changes. There are three lessons that I would like to share to you this morning. To end this message, number one, we could only give what we have. We cannot tell others about God if we don't know God. We cannot tell others of God's love if we haven't experienced his love. We cannot tell others to follow God if we are not following God. That's number one lesson. Number two, we could only make a difference in people's lives if Jesus is with us and in us. Before we go to our respective work, before we, we, we do many things or even do ministry, make sure Jesus is with us. Before we go out from our house, from our home, make sure Jesus is with us. We don't know. When is the right, the best opportunity for us to become a blessing to other people? And if that opportunity, opportunity comes, then we could share Jesus in the lives of other people. And number three lesson, it's we should take care to develop our spiritual life if we want to impart spiritual blessing to others. Yes, my friends, this story is a good reminder for each one of us that we have to be connected with Jesus. That Jesus should be seen in our words, our actions, our behavior, and everything we do. So that people will be blessed by our presence. And then one day, all of us will be going home to that beautiful place that God has prepared for each one of us. And we will be rejoicing. We will be uh, praising, jumping, and leaping with all of our voices raised in exaltation to God's name because he is great. And we have, we became his servant to tell others of God's love. I hope and I pray this morning that we will always do God wants us to do. We will always work until he comes. Happy Sabbath, everyone, and God bless. Amen. Amen.